since the fall of man, he has degenerated in all aspects of life. Mentally, physically, morally, spiritually. He has de uh, degenerated and for that reason the plan was devised <coughs> that man should be recovered, should be redeemed. <coughs> and today we also need that recovery Amen. from our um, spiritual, from our physical, from our moral uh, maladies. And there are four steps that we are going to consider in the recovery. And specifically, we will deal mostly on the physical recovery. To base our meditation this morning, we should open our Bibles in the Gospel of Matthew. And we read in chapter 9, from verse 1 to 8. Matthew 9, 1 to 8. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. In this experience, we find the four steps that should be taken in recovery. The four steps are optimism or positive thinking or good cheer. That's the first step. The second step is forgiveness of sins. The third is physical healing. And the fourth step is Glory be given to God. Interesting that before Jesus could heal this man, this, is, this was his word. Son, be of good cheer. You know, many people, when they are sick, they are cast down. They cannot smile, they cannot have joy, but this is exactly what is needed. 
That is the first step. Good cheer. In Proverbs, chapter 17, verse 22, the wise man says, Proverbs 17, 22, A merry heart doeth like a medicine, but a broken spirit drives the bones. A merry heart or a joyous heart, a happy heart, serves like a medicine. And in another, in another um, Bible verse in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 13, the wise man says, A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. Whenever there is some points from which we should be recovered, let us remember that this is the first step. Be of good cheer. Be optimist. Be encouraged. Have positive thinking. That's the first step. Because that will help a lot in the recovering. I do not say that will recover, but that will be a great help in the recovery. In whatever condition we may find, we must always trust in God. In Habakkuk chapter 3, Verses 17 and 18, we read this. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. If everything goes wrong, nothing is produced in the land. As um, the um, prophet says here, the fig tree, the vine, and the, all crops in the field may not produce. He said, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. That is a great help. Even in our sufferings, not only physical suffering, but if we are persecuted, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 11, and 12, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Rejoice when you are persecuted. That's not easy, is it? When you are persecuted and you should rejoice with exceeding joy, Jesus said. It's not easy. And yet is one element that is necessary. As the Apostle Paul, writing to the Philippians in chapter 4, verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord when? Always. Always. And he said, and again I say, 
rejoice. Interestingly that in that uh, epistle of Paul to the Philippians, he mentions many times the word rejoice, be glad, have joy. You know why we should be of good cheer? Because there is a very close relationship between the mind and the body. And if the mind is cast down, that affects the body. Let me read this to you from Ministry of Healing, page 241. It says, the relation that exists between the mind and the body is very intimate. When one is affected, either of them, when one is affected, the other sympathizes. The condition of the mind affects the health to a far greater degree than many realize. Many of the diseases from which men suffer are the result of mental depression. So what is it that happens today? Don't we hear about mental depression everywhere? And here we read that many of diseases are a result of mental depression. Grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down the life forces and to invite decay and death. Why is it that we have to have good cheer? Because these things will not help us. These things mentioned here, grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, or even physical suffering, if we always think about it, will not help us. Disease is sometimes produced and is often greatly aggravated by the imagination. You know, there are many imaginary diseases. Not all diseases are imaginary. There are traumas which is the medical term for accidents. But uh, it says, sometimes is produced and greatly aggravated by imagination. Many are lifelong invalids who might be well if they only thought so. If they would be cheerful, they would not suffer so much. Many imagine that every slight exposure will cause illness, and the evil effect is produced because it is expected. Many die from disease the cause of which is wholly imaginary. Can you see that? Many people die from disease. And the cause was just imagination. And they became sick because they imagined so. But even if they are sick, the counsel of the Spirit of Prophecy is this. I read, same page. Courage, hope, faith, sympathy, love. Promote health and prolong 
the life. And it's quoted here the same verse that we uh, mentioned. A contented mind, a cheerful spirit is a health to the body and strength to the soul. A merry, rejoicing heart doeth good like a medicine. Proverbs 17, 22. In the treatment of the sick, the effect of mental influence should not be overlooked. Rightly used, this influence affords one of the most effective agencies for combating disease. So, brethren, when we have any problem that we need restoration, especially physical disease, what is counseled in the Word of God? Be of good cheer, positive, courage, hope, faith, sympathy, love. This promotes health and prolong life. This is the first step, optimism, positive thinking. Be joyful, be of good cheer. And the second step is forgiveness of sin. Before the physical can be, physical healing can be affected, there must be the second step, forgiveness of sins. In Psalm 32, 1 and 2, we read, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. And in Psalm 103, verses 1 to 3, we read, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and uh, all that is in, within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Did you notice how the psalmist puts uh, the order of the event. He forgives your iniquity and then he will heal your disease. So before we receive physical recovery, we should have the sweet feeling of forgiveness of God of all our sins. In um, James chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, we read, Is any sick among you? Let him call for, for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. When we get sick, what is the first thing that we do? Generally, what people do, the first thing when they are sick, they go to see the doctor, isn't it? Go to see the doctor. Now, what does the Bible teach us? If anyone is sick, whom he should go and see? The Bible says, let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray. 
over him. Pray for what? First of all, for forgiveness of sins. Now, there is one point here that uh, is mentioned that he should be anointed. In our church, we do not follow the custom of common and popular churches. That for any little thing, they go and they anoint the person with olive oil. But they anoint the affected part of the body. We do not do that. Let me just mention to you that we consider that the anointing of the sick is a most solemn act. Because of the anointing of the sick depends either the recovery or the death of the person. We have had many experiences in our church the people, they requested to be anointed because they knew that there was no possibility of recovery of health. And they wanted to be anointed. And I know at least two cases that the person were, was anointed and the next day they died. But I know also one case that the person was anointed and was fully recovered, totally recovered. And we do not perform anointing of anybody except it is requested. And when a person requests to be anointed, we should appeal to the conscience of the sick person, and he must be conscious. We do not believe in the extreme unction of one that is in a state of coma or fainted. No, the person that is anointed must be conscious of what is going on. The person must have peace with God, must feel in himself the forgiveness of all sins. And then the uh, elder or the minister make the anointing on the forehead with the thumb and pray that God's will be done, either to recover or hasten the rest, uh, ceasing from all suffering. The Spirit of Prophecy mentioning this text of James uh, in Medical Ministry, page 16 and 17, says, I understand the text in James is to be carried out when a person is sick upon his bed if he calls for the elders of the church. If he calls for the elders of the church, that can be done. And they carry out the directions in James, anointing the sick with oil in the name of the Lord, praying over him the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. If he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. It cannot be our duty to call for the elders of the church for every little ailment we have. For this would be putting a task upon the elders. If all should do this, their time would be fully employed when could do nothing else. They could do nothing else. But the Lord gives us the privilege of seeking Him individually in 
earnest prayer. So, the anointing is a very delicate, very sacred, very serious question. The anointing of sick. And we do not perform it often. But when it is requested, then we will do. But we will do only with a consciousness of the person and when we see that he is in full peace with God. Prayer is very important. Selected Message Book 3, 296 says, with all our treatments given to the sick, simple fervent prayer should be offered for the blessing of healing. We are to point the sick to the compassionate Savior and His power to forgive and to heal. Through His gracious providence, they may be restored. Point the sufferers to their advocate in the heavenly courts. Tell them that Christ will heal the sick if they will repent and cease to transgress the laws of God. Here is the condition. We should point the, to the sick that Christ will heal the sick under this condition. If they will repent, confess their sins, and they cease to transgress God's law. We have read in Matthew about the man of palsy that Jesus healed. But before Jesus healed him, he offered forgiveness of sins. He counseled him to be cheerful and then offered forgiveness. And then he said, now you take up your bed and go to your home. Minister of Healing, page 77 says, the paralytic found in Christ healing for both the soul and the body. One cannot be separated from the other. The soul and the body should be healed. He needed health of soul before he could appreciate health of the body. Before the physician, physical malady could be healed, Christ must bring relief to the mind. First point, relief to the mind. Cleanse the soul from sin, second step. This lesson should not be overlooked. There are today thousands suffering from physical disease who, like the paralytic, are longing for the message, thy sins are forgiven. The burden of sin with its unrest and unsatisfied desires is the foundation of their maladies. They can find no relief until they come to the healer of the soul. The peace which he alone can impart would restore vigor to the mind and health to the body. No relief can be found until one comes to the Savior, to the great healer and with repentance confesses sin and cease to transgress God's law. The Savior ministered to both the soul and body. The gospel which he taught was a message of spiritual life and of physical restoration, deliverance from sin, and the healing of disease were linked together. 
So this is the second step. Forgiveness of sins. Repentance and a commitment not to transgress God's law any further. Now comes the physical healing. On page 112, Ministry of Healing, I read this. The Savior in His miracles revealed the power that is continually at work in man's behalf to sustain and to heal him. Through the agencies of nature, God is working day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, to keep us alive, to build up and restore us. When any part of the body sustains injury, a healing process is at once begun. Nature's agencies are set at work to restore soundness. But the power working through these agencies is the power of God. All life-giving power is from Him. When one recovers from disease, it is God who restores him. Amen. So who is the healer? God. Amen. And God left in nature elements that we could use to uh, help in the restoration of uh, physical maladies. In the book Child Guidance 366, this is, men, it is mentioned here what are the elements that God left for us as means that we should use to restore physical health. Pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, trust in the divine power. These are the true remedies. Do we have these remedies? How much do they cost? God left in nature, pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, water, but we should also have sometimes rest and sometimes exercise. And above, trust in the divine power. These are the true remedies. Every person should have a knowledge of nature's remedial agencies and how to apply them. It is essential both to understand the principles involved in the treatment of the sick and to have a practical training. You know, many people, they think, well, if we are sick, we should only pray and God would heal us. Yes, prayer is very important. But we cannot cross our arm and say, well, let God heal me. He should cooperate with God using the means that he left in nature. Amen. There is one in interesting statement in Council Diet and Food. Uh, many times I was thinking about this statement, and I will read it. There are many ways of practicing the healing art. But there is only one way that heaven approves. God's remedies are the simple agencies of nature that will not tax or debilitate the system through their powerful properties. And again mentioned what are these agencies? Pure air, water, cleanliness, proper diet, purity of life, and a firm trust 
in God are the remedies for the want of which thousands are dying. Are these remedies sought for? You know why? Because they are not like the anesthetic that deadens immediately the pain. It is um, back in Child Guidance 366, it says, the use of natural remedies requires an amount of care and effort mm -hmm. Amen. that many are not willing to give. Nature's process of healing and upbuilding is gradual. Mm -hmm. it not, it's not sudden, it's gradual. And to the impatient, it seems slow. The surrender of hurtful indulgences requires sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it will be found that nature, untrammeled, does her work wisely and well. Amen. Those who pray persevere in obedience to her laws will reap the reward in health of body and health of mind. Natural treatment is slow, but in the end is effective. And this is the only way that heaven approves, we read, read for, uh, before. It is not a denial of faith to use such remedies as God has provided to alleviate pain and to aid nature in her work of restoration. It is not denial of faith to cooperate with God and to place themselves in condition most favorable to recovery. Many Times I heard people saying, oh, we should use no remedy at all. God can heal. Surely he can. But he left in nature means that we should use Amen. to recover. Amen. And we should cooperate with God in this work. Mm -hmm. And when we are recovered from physical malady, what happens? Usually, you know what happens? We forget about God mm -hmm. who healed us. Mm -hmm. We do not even come and glorify God. Mm -hmm. We do not return. We have an experience in the Bible in Luke chapter 17, verses 12 to 19. Let's read Luke 17, 12 to 19. It says, and as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Where are were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith had made thee whole. Interesting experience. Ten were healed. How many returned to give thanks to God? One. Where were the nine? They forgot 
This is why the Bible says, Bless the Lord and do not forget all His benefits. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, pages 179, 180. I read this. Here is a lesson for us all. These lepers were so corrupted by disease that they had been restricted from society lest they should contaminate others. Their limits had been prescribed by the authorities. I don't know how many of you had the experience of witnessing uh, leprosy. In one country where I traveled, I've seen many lepers. Some of them, they had no hand, others had no arm, others had no ear, others had no nose, others had no, le no foot, no leg, because the leprosy ate up and destroyed totally. And the shocking thing is that without pain. They do not feel any pain. First the nerve dies out and then the flesh start decomposing and falls from the body and it doesn't feel pain. In uh, the Old Testament, the lepers, they had to be separated from the community. And now here comes the ten lepers to Jesus, crying for help. And Jesus helped them. And after they were healed, most of them forgot to come and glorify God. Thank Jesus for his healing power. I read further. It says, Jesus comes within their sight and in their great suffering, they cry unto him alone, cry to him who alone has power to relieve them. Jesus bid them show themselves to the priests. They have faith to start on their way, believing in the power of Christ to heal them. As they go on their way, they realize that the horrible disease had left them but only one has feelings of gratitude. Only one feels his deep indebtedness to Christ for this great work wrought for him. This one returns praising God and in the greatest humiliation falls at the feet of Christ, acknowledging with thankfulness the work wrought for him. And this man was a stranger. The other nine were Jews. Here is a lesson for us all. When we are healed, what is our duty? Praise God. Thank God for their recovery. Amen. The remark is often made by one and another. Why depend so much on sanitariums? Why do not we pray for the miraculous healing of the sick as the people of God used to do? This was a question um, directed to the servant of the Lord. Why is it? And now she says, in the early history of our work, many were healed by prayer. And some, after they were healed, pursued the same course in the indulgence of appetite as they had followed in the past. When one is healed, is not only uh, sufficient to praise God, but he should not go back to practicing 
the, the, um, the habit that they practiced before. They did not live and work in such a way as to avoid sickness. They did not show that they appreciated the Lord's goodness to them. Again and again, they were brought to suffering through their own careless, thoughtless course of action. How could the Lord be glorified in bestowing on them the gift of health? You know, when Jesus healed, uh, he many times he said, now you go, you are healed, you are made whole, go and sin no more. Let us remember, brethren, these four steps in recovery. Be of good cheer. We must have forgiveness of our sins. Then the great healer is able to heal us. He will not heal all. Some he sees fit to lay them to have rest, but many are healed. And those that are healed now have a responsibility to glorify God, to praise God and thank Him for His marvelous work. May the Lord bless us and help us that we may keep these thoughts in our minds. In my wish and prayer, amen. amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before Thee in the precious name of Jesus with thankful hearts and we appreciate all that heaven has done for our recovery from our maladies. We ask thee to help us that we may cheer up, trust in thee, and we may uh, receive forgiveness of our sins so that our physical, mental, and spiritual uh, illness may be healed and help us also that we may not forget to glorify thy name and thank thee for all that thou hast done for us. We ask to bless each one of us here present and those whom we represent. Bless thy people all over the world. Be with those who are suffering and help them that they may be healed if it is thy will. If not, in everything thy will be done. We ask it to dismiss us now with thy blessing and forgiveness of our sins, mistakes and shortcomings. Give us thy peace in our hearts, for we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.